You're listening to Mixed Reality Cabaret on KB Beach Radio, 88.1 FM HD3, across the globe at kbeach.org. This is Glenn Zuckman at the LA Times Festival of Books here on the campus of the University of Southern California, and I'm here with author Lisa C. Lisa C. is the author of numerous books, including most recently, 2007, Peony in Love, 2009, Shanghai Girls, and 2011, Dreams of Joy. Lisa C., welcome to Mixed Reality Cabaret. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so I thought we would talk about these two new books, uh, mm -hmm. Shanghai Girls and Dreams of Joy. And I have lots of questions, but maybe you could set the two books up a little bit, just sure. to describe them a bit. So Shanghai Girls starts in Shanghai, two sisters, 1937, and um, bad things happen to them, the Japanese invade, and they come to the United States in arranged marriages and end up here in Los Angeles, at a, uh, working, do you want that to pass? <laughs> um, they end up here in Los Angeles, living in Chinatown and working in what was a, a tourist attraction, an early tourist attraction here in Los Angeles called China City. And so that's sort of the, how that starts. And then um, it ends in 1957 with something called the Confession Program. And to me, I thought that was the end of the book. The end is a new beginning, but I ended up writing a oh, sequel. So you didn't know the sequel was no, coming? I, I didn't. Wow. Uh, actually, what happened was I had plotted out a novel that I thought was going to go from 1937 to 2007. And I got about 100 pages in, and I was still in Shanghai, still in 1937, so I knew I was going to have to just rethink the whole thing, otherwise it would have been, you know, 2,000 pages long. And one thing, I knew I wanted to write about the confession program. I just had this real sense that if I didn't do it now, I might not ever have another chance. And so, like I said, the end was a new beginning. I, the whole novel had changed just now that I had changed the timing of it. But, uh, and I had come up with three other ideas for uh, the new book. I went back to New York to talk to my editor about those three ideas, and we were talking about them when the publisher came in, and she said, no, we want you to write one, those books one of these days, but first you've got to write the sequel. Oh, wow. And so I really, I have to tell you, I really resisted in the beginning. I, I thought, um, the end is in the beginning. I mean, I just, I really fought it, but I'm nothing if not an obedient Chinese daughter. And so I came home, started doing the research, and when I saw what would happen, what could happen in 1957, if you followed Joy, the daughter, into China, when China was closed, and that her mother, Pearl, would go after her, and that they'd be arriving just in time for the launch of the Great Leap Forward, I thought, okay, I'm in. And so I never went back to that original outline. It's this whole two books ended up completely different from the, the you know, that original idea. So anyway, the first book is Two Sisters, Leave Shanghai, Come Here. And then the second book is The Daughter Goes Back to China and Her Mother Pearl Follows. Well, I'm certainly glad you wrote both. <laughs> um, the, the first one does end a little, you know, in the middle for me, which maybe is a good place in terms of making me think, but it was, it was nice to have a, the, a bit of the completion that right. you get with the, with the second. Um, there are many themes in these books. Uh, there are many people in these books. The people are very detailed. No one's all good. Almost no one is all bad. Um, but there are kind of some, I suppose, bad guys or villains, and they tend to be nations, it seems to me. You know, first Japan, then the United States, then China. Um, so I, I want to ask you about nations, I want to ask you about gender, I want to ask you about some of these themes that are so powerful on page after page right. of these books. Uh, but I want to start with a question that's maybe not so obvious to all readers, but was kind of my own idiosyncratic read of the book. I guess we'll point this at me. Um, you know, those other themes exist powerfully on page after page, chapter after chapter. Something that came to me really late in the reading of the two books, but ultimately dominated my thought so dramatically was a connection or a kinship that I felt um, between Pearl and the performance artist Alan Capro. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. Right. But um, I'm not. So, <laughs> so. so it's you know it's uh, it's the late 50s, the early 60s. Um, 
uh, you know, the United States has had this, uh, you know, triumphant sort of outcome out of World War II, and among other things, the capital of the art world has moved from Paris to New York City. Mm -hmm. um, and Alan Capro in the late 50s, early 60s invents the happening, um, really the defining art form of a generation. So here he is in the capital of the art world, he's created the form that defines the times. Um, any other artist I can think of then or now probably would have said, how do I take this even higher? Mm -hmm. And Capro did the exact opposite. He, he said, this is too much. Um, he left New York, he went not to a bad place, but to the opposite end of the continent. He, he crawled down to the University of California, San Diego, where he spent the rest of his life. Um, and he never did another happening. He created a new form called the activity, which has a, a kinship maybe to the, to the happening, but it's a much smaller, more personal uh, action. Um, for example, he would say two people take a walk in the grass for, go in a given direction for 30 minutes and at the end of that 30 minutes turn around retrace your steps but as you retrace your steps unfold every blade of grass that you've folded down wow okay so you know that would take a day right and um, it's that kind of detail that he always paid attention to things um, you know, where I teach at, at Long Beach State, behind the theater, when I go out to my car in the parking lot, there's a car that is covered with bumper stickers. And one of them, of the sticker says, what would Jesus do? Mm -hmm. But every time I see that sticker, I never see what would Jesus do. I always see what would Alan do. Right. Because my impulses always are a little bit grandiose and heroic. It's like, oh, this new art project, or oh, I could teach the class this way. Right. And I always think he would do less, not, not less as in, he would do a simpler thing that would be more. Right. And ultimately, I felt like that was Pearl's journey, that you know, in these books, um, we're longing for this great escape, this great rescue. They talk about it, and you, you long for it, and it's, um, you know, when are they, when, when do, how many more pages, how many more chapters till we escape, till we get out, till right. we can be Shanghai girls again? Right. Um, and, you know, it, it's never, so here we are, University of Southern California, we are in Hollywood, we are in the dream factory, and your books, to me, are sort of the opposite of the Hollywood film, um, where the hero swoops in and saves, you know, the girl, the world, whatever they're mm -hmm. saving today. Um, there's never a deus ex machina grandiose. It's very small and subtle. And, and when an offer finally comes from a friend in DC, Pearl says, um, you know, no, uh, this is my family, this is my home. But mm -hmm. it's, it's not a great like dream fantasy family home. It's something that she's come to appreciate after so long. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's... Um, Somehow, Pearl and Alan Capro, for me, have a, have a connection in that way. I don't know if, if, if my connection makes sense well, to you. Well, so, so first of all, I'd never heard of him, so, the, but that, so thank you. I, that's really very interesting. I think for me, for Pearl, in, in Shanghai Girls, it's like every bad thing that could possibly happen to this woman happens to her. <laughs> she doesn't get a single break every single bad thing that could happen. And that doesn't mean there aren't moments of joy along the way, but it is true, a lot of bad stuff happens. And then in the second book, it's like, you're right, she is kind of retracing her steps. To me, both of these books together are very much about home, and where is your, ho like, where is your home where you were born? How do you make a new home? What is your home in terms of country? Uh, what what makes home? Who makes home? So as she and she is retracing her steps, she literally goes back to the house that she grew up in and the ways that it's changed, the ways that it's remained the same. She's you know when she left, it was a very pretty grand house, you know, and it was servants. And when she comes back, the the main the lowest servant when she left now sort of runs the household because now it's a communist country. And I, it's not, it, you're right, it's not easy for her. And she does have to, I wouldn't think of it as grass, but sort of like peel back layer after layer after layer to try to get back, uh, maybe not so much to home, like as we think of as a house, but the home of, of, um, of, of peace. And one of, one of the things that I really wanted for this book, for, for Dreams of Joy, was a happy ending. And I, I'm not known for happy endings, I don't think. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think anyone say, Lisa C. always has a happy ending. No, I mean, I really just don't have happy endings. But that was a goal. Could I even write one? You know, 
And but so, I mean, it was earned after 750 it, pages exactly. of struggle to get there. And I, one of the, um, there was a, an aphorism that really, I felt really guided me with dreams of joy. And it was something that was written by Han Yin, a, a poet in China in the 17th century. And he wrote, there is soft happiness in sadness and deep sadness in happiness. And I thought, well, this is, this is Pearl. This is, that is, and it is true. You know, you go to a, even in a moment of great happiness, I don't know, a, wedding or something, there can always be that sort of little kernel of sadness because you don't, it's a loss for some people, uh, you don't know what's going to happen. And so I, I think that that is very much there and, and how, you, how she gets there is that sort of unpeeling, unpeeling, unpeeling and kind of letting go of, let's put it another way, all the grass that's been crushed on her, she has to let it up and out. So, um, so let's talk about these these nations. Um, in in their adventures, you know, they they grapple with with first Japan, then the United States, then China, and the the at, at the hands of Japan, if if you will, the so to speak rape of Nanking um, is such a horrific blunt force trauma. In terms of number of pages, right. it's it's relatively brief, uh, but certainly scarring for life. Right. Then they come to the United States where it's not quite so blunt force, but it's such a protracted ordeal um, that, that, that never goes away and continues to be oppressive. And then finally, when we go back to China, um, at first it seems like China maybe will get a more balanced treatment and, and that there will be some positive, uh, but ultimately that seems almost more like an inoculation against just the, the hor horrible ordeal to come there. Um, uh, so tell me about nations. Well, you know, I do write historical novels, and so they, you know, I, I am choosing these moments in history that that uh, are just very much at the heart of the book. And so, I think starting in 1937, one of the reasons I started then and in Shanghai is that I've always been fascinated by uh, this idea of Shanghai as the Paris of Asia. You know, very grand. It was, you know, great wealth on one hand, dire, dire poverty, uh, very sophisticated city. People who come from all over the world to be in this Paris of Asia. And then in 1937, when the first bombs dropped during the Sino Japanese War, you know, that, that's, a, that's like that's the beginning of this very abrupt change. Sino Japanese War rolls right into Civil War, uh, sorry, into World War II. As soon as World War II is over, Civil War. 1949, Mao takes over the country, and and he took a very dim view of Shanghai. You know, he looked at it as kind of like a woman with a bad past, a woman who should be punished, and so Shanghai had sort of gone from being the the you know Paris of Asia to being more like the Fresno of Asia, almost overnight, and so it, so partly. You know, what happens when a country invades? And yes, there is the rape of Nanking. Um, you know, and I didn't write about that, although there definitely is a rape in this book. I don't think that's a big giveaway. Um, but, you know, we live in a world of continuing wars, of continuing invasions. Uh, I, I just, it's, you know, how does a country react to that, what what does that mean? And I and I think very specifically with war, with my books, you know, the the way we typically learn history is about the front line, right? The generals, the soldiers, the politicians, the presidents. But if you take one step back, now you're in the back line with the women, the children, the elderly, and they have to continue their lives. You know, you, those women, they have to somehow get food for their children, clothes for their children, educate their children, they, they comfort their children. They're keeping life going, even though that war is still out there. And so that's the story I'm interested in, in at least in the war aspect, is what's happening in that back line. So that sort of takes care of how I sort of was thinking about China and Japan. Then with the United States, uh, you know, I did grow up in a very large Chinese-American family. I am part Chinese. My great-grandfather was the kind of godfather patriarch of Los Angeles Chinatown. He had four wives. One was Caucasian, obviously. 
And I just know even from my own experience growing up that there was so little taught about the Chinese American experience. I mean, basically, we learned that yes, they worked on the railroad. So, you know, I know from my own family that there was a lot of other stuff, the Chinese Exclusion Act, all these other laws, the miscegenation laws, which my family obviously sort of skirted around and broke, uh, the land laws. You know, I have an uncle, here we are at USC, I have an uncle who was only the seventh, what is it, Chinese American architect student here. Wow. And, and in my family, there were those people who were maybe not the very first, but they would always sort of be in the top 10. Oh, he was the fifth this or the sixth that. So that was very cl close to me as I was growing up. And so I, I think that this is stuff, you know, most people, even if they live in San Francisco, may not have known what happened on Angel Island. Um, and even in the Chinese American community, something that was so kept a secret because of the shame and embarrassment. So I, I, I don't know how I would think of that as a country, except that we have done things as a country that aren't so good to the people who live here and we know that that continues even today you know it's not like it's some big surprise and certainly with um, with sort of the early book and, and then it ending with that confession program and um, the, I guess the fear of the other and I guess you see that you know in China with Japan too that fear of the other and then here with this Chinese uh, the fear of the other and then going back into China um, I'm just talking, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to answer this because I hadn't, no one's ever asked me this question quite this way. Uh, I guess, I think to, to say the very short form is I'm trying to look at aspects of countries that people may not have thought about in quite that way, you know, and, and you, we have kind of an image of what the United States is like and, you know, home of the free and we'll take all, we'll take all of your suffering masses and all of that. Yeah, I think, it's that, not, I think it's that's not, been repealed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, that, that exactly, that just doesn't really exist and never really did. And then with China, certainly in those early days of the People's Republic of China, uh, again, I grew up believing China was closed. There was a bamboo curtain, it's closed. You can't go in, you can't come out, it's closed. But it was a bamboo curtain, not an iron curtain. Iron you can't pass through, bamboo you can see through, it's pliable, it's flexible. And there were so many people going in and so many people coming out. And so I really wanted to write partly about this fluidity of this border. And I guess maybe that's something else, is these fluidities of these borders that we think of as this country and that country. but. It's always coming sort of back and forth. And then just lastly with China, uh, I think it's very easy sometimes in hindsight to look back and say, those were terrible years. Oh, that Mao, he was a terrible person. Don't get me wrong. He was a pretty, you know, seriously terrible person. But there was, in the beginning of that country, such optimism. Now, it's true that every bad thing that could, they could have chosen to do, they did. It was like every, every time they... Using the broken glass for fertilizer yes, was pretty was just, amazing. You know, that was just a big mistake. And nobody said no. You know, they just thought, well, he, we can do no wrong. This has got to work. And so that, I think that sense of... of um, optimism versus the reality. Maybe that's true for all of these, you know, Shanghai, the optimism versus the reality, uh, Chinese American experience, the optimism versus the reality, and then certainly going back into China, uh, the optimism versus the reality, or the horribleness versus some of the good things that also did happen. In so I, I guess I don't mean to ask an overly simplistic question since after all your work is so nuanced, but I mean, is it the nature of nations to oppress? I don't know. Is it? Well, I don't know. You give some pretty, pretty <laughs> compelling examples. I think, I don't know that Although it's the said, nature of 
I don't know if it's actually the nature of nations to oppress, but they'll do it if they want to. I mean, here we are, uh, that bombing, Boston bombing suspect, I and mean, we just last night we had this big discussion about should he have been read his Miranda rights. Now I think all of us think, you know, put it, let's. I think it's pretty. I mean, I don't know, but I'm, it seems pretty clear he's guilty. Um, but aren't you? That's like a. The Supreme Court said you've got to be read your Miranda rights, but somehow we, we're making an exception here in this case. So why is that? I don't know why it is. So I think that's the thing is you have to look at, you know, I think every country is nuanced. There are these nuances. I don't think that they set out to oppress, but a government will oppress if it feels threatened. So we start with optimism and then, and then uh, pragmatism seeps in yeah. whatever form it, it chooses Yeah, and I'm not take. saying, you know, I mean, see, we don't know right now. There are things that we don't know because we're still living too much in it. Uh, Guantanamo, you know, we don't know. We're not, we don't really yet have the perspective. On that. Yeah, some and, future Lisa C is going to write some right, really some, difficult work yeah, about Guantanamo. And, and uh, you know, we don't know, maybe all those people there, they had some big plan that you and I just don't know about, you know, but we don't know and we don't have the perspective and we don't have the knowledge yet. Fifty years from now, they're going to start releasing documents and we'll, we'll know more about what happened. But right now, you're just in it. It's like, you know, with this bombing in, in uh, Boston, we don't have any perspective. We're just in it and we're just sort of relying on what the TV tells us, which we know already has been wrong, 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 you know. So you, you don't necessarily have the perspective. But what I think, you know, one of the things with, with, with my writing, I, and I see this a lot with, with uh, readers who make this connection of, geez, this is a lot like what's happening today. Oh, that happened there, but oh, we have something like that that's happening right now. You know, and, and um, I think that that's what histor history and historical novels can do, is that it can sort of, sh the past can shine a light a little bit on what's happening right now today. And it may not be like my intention when I sit down to write a new novel. Is, oh, I want to write something that's going to really be, feel current today. That's not where I'm starting from, but if people can look at that history and, and, and yeah, I think that's really great. I mean, I love that when they do that. I mentioned the performance artist Alan Capro, who reminded me of Pearl, and um, the performance artist Marina Abramovic, who actually reminds me of Peony, but I'll, I'll spare you that analogy. Okay. But in one of her early works, her work is very difficult, and it's about usually her own body, but in an early work, Rhythm Zero, she laid out a table full of objects and said the audience can do whatever they want with these objects to me for you know however many hours in that evening and it was a really creepy night where people did all kinds of crazy things and you know people put a gun to her head and maybe somebody pulled the gun away but all in all it was a really terrible night in, in many ways um, and decades later she spoke about that and said you know in all these years I've never met a single person who was at that performance and she said, you know, I can't imagine that I've never again seen someone at that performance. What I think is, must be the case is that I have again encountered some of those people, but everyone was so embarrassed and ashamed right. at what happened that night that no one wants to admit that they were there, which, you know, I asked about nations, but of course, ultimately, um, the acts, the, the, the atrocities of nations are carried out in the hands of individuals in, in our rape of Nanking. I mean, those are individual soldiers. It's a group mind, I'm sure, but uh, it's individual soldiers at, at Angel Island and, and then the later McCarthyism. You know, that's a nation, but it is also these individual people and, and, and the events in China. And how is it that these horrific things can happen that any, in, any individual participant of, it seems like, would never dream of by themselves, and yet somehow they're swept up and and end up participating okay. in... So I, I have a two-part answer. Okay. And the first actually goes back to the talking about the, the nations, which I realized I answered that all completely wrong. <laughs> um, you know, I was talking before about how we learn history really with that front line, and I'm interested in the back line. 
But there's also something else, which is we do learn history in terms of wars and dates. But history is something that happens to individual people. You know, it's what happens to that individual person. So if we think of all the books that have been written about the Holocaust, what is the one book we all know and remember? The Diary of Anne Frank. One little girl, her family, that upstairs room, and you have this emotional connection to this, you know, this girl and her family because history is something that happens to individual people. And that's how we connect. That's how we, we you know, it's really, to me, isn't about the, the nations. It's about those people who are living through those moments and, and those choices you make. You know, do you rise to the occasion? Do you sink? Do you succeed? Do you fail? Um, do you find generosity in your heart or do you actually go in a very different way? Do you follow the masses or do you somehow find a way to maintain your own ethics and morality even in those moments of mass craziness? So that's part one uh, that really should have been the answer to that last question. Oh, now I forgot part two. Um, what was the question? How was the question? Just remind me. So how that uh, the idea of nations uh, committing these horrific acts. Okay, so acts yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. So, uh, so again, if you think of it as being something that's happened to individuals, so here's an example: the confession program of 1957. This was a government-instituted program uh, that very specifically targeted Chinese Americans who had come here as paper sons. So, in other words, the sort of fake paper, fake sons of fake American citizens. And it's the height of the McCarthy, you know, it's, it's the whole Red Scare McCarthyism. People are terrified of, you know, the bamboo curtain and communism spreading and the domino, all those things. And the confession program asks people who came as paper sons to step forward, confess, and in exchange they'll be given their legitimate U.S. citizenship. It confess and out everyone here. Well, yes. Yeah, so, well, well, but, but the, that's how it first came. It was like, you know, oh, okay. confess and you'll be given your legitimate U.S. citizenship. And then, of course, there was that small print that said, and oh, by the way, you also have to rat out people you know who came here illegally your friends, your relatives, your business associates, your neighbors. And so this was a program that ripped apart communities, destroyed businesses, um, caused deep, terrible rifts in families. And it's something that has, al almost nothing has been written about it um, by academics and scholars. Because the people who were either targeted in that program or ratted out someone in that program, they don't want to talk about it. You know, they still to this day have so much shame and embarrassment and guilt and bitterness that they just haven't talked about it. So it's really very, given an very impossible little. Sophie's Choice kind of choice. Right, and, and it's just, they don't want, I mean, it's just, you know, it was terrible. They don't want to talk about it. So if you, you know, look in most history books of that time period, you're not going to see this. So uh, I thought, I had, this is something, you know, these people aren't getting any younger, and I want to find some people who lived through that program, and, and what happened to them? And I remember talking to this one woman in Washington, D.C. It was her father, one of five children born here, and her father stepped forward, confessed. The day he got his citizenship, they came to deport his mother, the, her, his wife, her mother, Mary's mother. And, the, you know, you don't really want to be deported to People's Republic of China so it wasn't in 1957. Even friends, but actual oh, your yeah, like like your it could wow. be your wife or your wow. children or you know your neighbor. I mean, it could have been anybody if you reported them. And so they fought for eight years to keep her here, and they ultimately won. I talked to a man here in Southern California in his 80s. He talked about how he and his brother had stepped forward, confessed, and their story actually was pretty straightforward. But at the end, he said to me, you know, we have never told our children, we have never told our grandchildren what I just told you. 
because we aren't dead yet, so we aren't safe yet. So here, all these years later, 50, 60, what is it, 60 years later, this fear still there that somehow, even though they're now legitimate U.S. citizens and all that is behind them, that they could still be deported, that something bad could happen to them. And so that takes something that on paper could just be a paragraph of the U.S. had this program, but actually takes it to that individual person of, of what happened. You know, what, what did that do to that family? And, and what were the repercussions of it? Because we know that these things don't just happen in a vacuum. You know, when in our own lives, we know that something that happens to us that's really traumatic or scary or frightening or horrific or happy, you know, it, 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 it isn't something that just happens and then it goes away. It's something that stays with you for the rest of your life and, and has an impact on you. And that is how history affects individual people. And, and I think if with my writing, if I can get to that where a reader is with these characters and thinking about what choices would I make? You know, what choice, if I were in this situation, uh, uh, the great leap forward in China, you know, and, and now you, you see that sort of mass movement and this kind of mass thing where everybody's all, they, we're all signed up, we're all going to do it and things start to go bad, you know, what would you do? What would you do? Would you think, oh, you know, swap child make food? Oh, I would never participate in that. And yet people did. And so I, with, with Dreams of Joy, you know, in, in Shanghai Girls, definitely there's the whole part about the confession program. And, but that was still a pretty small program. The uh, Great Leap Forward, this was the entire country. 45 million people starved to death in three years. So what, you know, how does that happen? What, what, is, what is that process of how that happens? And interestingly, I've had a lot of um, rabbis tell me that they use that book with, because people will say to them, you know, how could the Jews have let the Holocaust happened? Why didn't they fight back? Why didn't they rise up? Why didn't they, you know, and, they'll, and, and I think that that's something many people think about, but you know, especially if you're Jewish, you can think like, why did, why did, why, why wasn't there more? And he says he, I mean, several rabbis have told me that they use dreams of joy because it really shows how you think one little thing happens, oh, whatever, another one, oh, not so bad. Oh, now they're taking this away from me. Oh, it's okay, it's just a passing phase. And, oh, now you're, you're starting not to get food. Now you're getting weaker, you're getting colder. You're, and, and by the time you realize something really bad is happening, you don't have the strength to fight it. And that's something that happened during World War II. It's something that happened during the Great Leap Forward. It's something that happened with Ru in Russia under Stalin. It's something that happens today in other parts of the world with different kinds of, you know, ethnic cleansing, uh, revolutions, um, where you know you have this kind of group mentality, but it doesn't just pop out of nowhere. It, it's this one step after another that you finally do get to a place where you have lost your humanity and you have lost your ethics and morals. I brought some show and tell. Even though it's a radio show, I brought show and tell. Okay. Um, so maybe I will let you open this and okay. take a look as I describe what it is that we're looking at. So in pink the, box. Pink box. Um, in the middle, you can take the pink box oh, out. Oh, look at this. In the middle of the 20th century, uh, my father was an American GI stationed in this. Okinawa, and he bought this little uh, outfit for um, his daughter to be. Um, it turned out that his only child was me. Oh my I, gosh, how darling is this though? Isn't it incredible? Um, and, um, you know, I'm not quite sure how disappointed he was that I turned out to be a boy child and uh -huh. not the girl child that uh -huh. he had wanted. Um, safe to say my father would not be a prominent character in most of your books. Um, for some reason he really wanted a girl child. Uh, you have written so much about this 
uh, preference for boy children and this, uh, mm -hmm. this, this just utter devaluation of, of girl children. And, you know, there are, there are so many challenges in these books. I find, I, I find your work very difficult to read, but it's a sort of a page-turningly difficult. That you can't put it down even though it's such a challenge. And many of these issues are eventually resolved or, you know, that Pearl finds a, a, a way to make peace with things. But the, the, the devaluation of girl children, the misogyny, is, is something that, you know, page after page, I keep waiting for this sort of elephant man-like moment where Pearl finally screams, I am a human being. Um, but that really doesn't come. Uh, can you, t so it, it's not unique to China, but certainly you have chronicled so much, um, I don't know if you use the word misogyny, but so much Chinese. See, actually, I have to disagree a, okay. a little bit in the sense that I, I, I actually disagree quite a bit. Okay. <laughs> um, I think there's that societal thing that happens in China about the devaluation of women and girls and girl babies and that that's very much part historically, culturally part of, of the culture. But at the same time, it's women who run the household, who uh, decide so many things. I mean, you know, running the household, I don't mean that they're like running the vacuum. I mean, there's, they, they, there's that outside world for men and that inside world for women where there's this incredible strength. And I, you know, in all of my books, so if you look at Snowflower and the Secret Fan, Peony in Love, um, Shanghai Girls, Dreams of Joy, the new one, China Doll's not out yet, but that these women have incredible strength, even as they're being told, you're worthless, you're un you, know, you're, you have no value, that they over and over again show what, what worth and value they do have. And, uh, you know, I think for me that it always seems so obvious where you think a, a girl baby has no value and yet the mother has carried that baby, nursed that baby, the dad is like bounced the baby on his knee, you know, little babies, little girls, they're cute, they're adorable, they have that cute little giggle, that how could you not love that child? Even though the culture is telling you it has no value, you don't love them. And so that's why there is that phrase, she was like a pearl in my palm that it, it's so precious, and but the whole relationship of having a daughter in China in the past was based on the fact that this it's not even someone from your own family, you're raising this child for another family. But even if you know that, how can you not have this connection? Uh, and then in China later, you know, one of the things Mao said, and he was the first to say it, is women hold up half the sky in the world and you know if you're a dictator you just tell people how it's going to be and so that meant that whether you wanted to or not if you were a woman you had to come out of your house work in the fields work in a factory go to school become a doctor a lawyer a dentist an engineer um, and so there were women in China who were doing things, really pretty remarkable, just, you know, all kinds of jobs, but some pretty remarkable things, when the rest of the Western world really wasn't there yet. And, uh, you know, if you look at China today, I, you could say it, you know, women are in every aspect of life, just as they are here. And same thing, they don't get equal pay for equal work, but that seems to be a universal. And if we look at other parts of the world today, um, you know, there's that sort of more first world where there's a lot of equality for women and, and it's, it's almost in a way not even an issue. And then in great, great numbers of countries, um, it, 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 it's as bad if not worse than it was in ancient China. So um, I think we're still sort of on a continuum of that. But uh, I just sort of had to disagree a little bit with, with your take. <laughs> In, in one of the panels yesterday, one of, one of the authors quoted the, the cliché idea that 
men write about important things like war and women write about unimportant things like families. And she was quoting it as a cliche, but still, I mean, there is, you know, I think that's a real perception for, for, for a lot of people. And that just seems like the opposite of, of the world that I'd, I'd like to live in. So how do we get upside down and do we ever get un-upside down? Or is it just another long, slow journey that we're working on? Well, okay, here's another cliche. I mean, it, you know, and I, just to go back first before I get to my cliche is, you know, I was already talking about that front line and then yes, the back yes. line. And you know, one doesn't actually have a value over the other. It just happens to be the way it is. Now, when we, we have 50% of all women so, are women soldiers, I bet the narrative will change, but we're not there yet. But here's the other thing, and again, I didn't make this up, and it is a total cliche. History, his story. It was sort of designed that way, you know, and, and um, so much of my writing, I think, is trying to go back and find these women's stories. You know, that there were women there all the way along the way. Women were there. Otherwise, none of us would be here, right? I mean, you know, they enough. had to be there. Yes. So they were experiencing all of these other things. They were just experiencing it in another way. I mean, and sometimes they were out in battle. But even if there was a war that was happening around them, and they weren't the ones holding the rifles or holding the spears or whatever, they were still experiencing that war. Um, and so I, I don't think of it as necessarily being domestic. I just think it's just another aspect of war, of history, of life. I mentioned, you know, in the beginning of your, so in the beginning of uh, Shanghai Girls, uh, so we, we have a brief uh, intro, we're having a good time, we're Shanghai Girls, and that's great. And then we suddenly find ourselves in w what I've been sort of paraphrasing as uh, the rape of Nanking, and I guess I use that term because... Well, it's a short, it's sort of a shorthand everybody knows about, you know. When I read Iris Chang's non-fiction book, so that was an intense read to be sure, and, and when those sort of analogous types of events happened in your book, I kind of felt like I was reading the, the fiction version that you had, in a way, taken some of that uh, intense material. And So she gives us the, the non-fiction version and that yours was the personalized individual mm -hmm. version. Um, and I guess you might say something about that connection, but I also note uh, sort of a bittersweet uh, connection here for this book festival that uh, this festival nine years ago, uh, when it was over at UCLA in 2004, was I think the last time either you or I uh, saw Iris Chang. We were on a panel together, and, and it was the last time I saw her. And uh, if you have thoughts, it's hard to believe it's nine years already, but your thoughts about her life and work, if, if that has resonated with you. I think she own. was an incredible writer, an incredible historian. Again, someone who I think was interested in history that had been lost, forgotten, deliberately covered up. And you see that in her work, uh, in all of her work, actually. This. Uh, way of, of sort of going and, and finding those lost stories and bringing them out. I mean, you know, even today there are people who say, well, the rape of Nanking never happened, but it did happen. And there's a lot of documents and, you know, actual proof. And she put it together in a way that people could really uh, see it and understand it and, and really realize what had happened. Um, you know, her last book was about the Chinese in America. And she she interviewed me, you know, for that book, and uh, I think, you know, I, I don't know, I suppose you're right that in a way we're, we're, we were both writing two sides of the same coin. Um, there's some people who just want to read straight history, and she did such a beautiful job doing that. But I, again, I'm sort of more interested in that individual story. And this, you know, really goes back to my own family uh, and, and the way they experience being Chinese Americans here and how I know how those laws and the discrimination affected them and the choices that they made. And, you know, all of our families are making choices all the way along. And, um, 
I know that I wouldn't be here if not for the things that they went through. You know, that it, and, it, and that I, every success that I have, it's on, I'm on, on their backs, you know, that brought me to this place. And so, you know, I could write a nonfiction book about foot binding, or I could have a fictional narrative where you're in the room with that girl who's having her feet bound. And it's not a, there's not one doesn't have more value or over another. I think it's actually just kind of an artistic and personality choice of, of the author. So speaking of being in the room with that girl as her uh, feet are being bound, um, why don't we talk a little bit about your, your the novel that precedes these two, uh, Peony and Love. Can you mm -hmm. describe what's that book So uh, Peony and Love is, is actually based on a true story. In the 17th century, there was an opera called the Peony Pavilion, um, a great love story, and young women were not allowed to see it. It was a it was an opera of 55 acts. It took about 20 hours to perform. Anyway, they weren't allowed to see it. They could only read it. And when these young women read it, young girls, they would catch cases of love sickness like the main character in the opera and then uh, waste away and die. And as they were dying, they wrote poems and stories which were then published after their deaths. And this all has all been part of this, you know, lovesick maiden's writing. And you could go today to a library or a bookstore that had a good Chinese collection of, of writings and poetry, and you would find, even today, some of their things that are written. Anyway, there were three young women, all married to the same man, one right after the other, who together all loved the Peony Pavilion, all caught cases of love sickness, all wasted away and died. But they, as they were dying, they would write their thoughts about love and about the opera in the margins of this one copy of the Peony Pavilion. And when they died, that was published, and it was the first book of its kind to have been written and published anywhere in the world by women. And so I took that story of the, and it's called the Three Wives Commentary, of how the Three Wives Commentary came into being, and um, this whole idea of lovesick maidens and ghost marriages, and, and sort of, you know, created a, a fictional story out of something that was true. That we, the Three Wives Commentary. So the, the word anorexia does not appear in your book, except I think maybe one time uh, in your notes at the end. Right. Um, but I, I, you know, after going through all that, I, I wonder how you think about the idea of anorexia, whether that's, I mean, it's manifest in a, in a particular body, but is it, a, is it a, so to speak, a disease of a person or a, of a family or a culture? Well, so, you know, we tend to have thought of anorexia as a contemporary, a modern disease, but in fact, you know, the more research that's done on anorexia, the more people think that it's been around forever. You know, that these lovesick maidens, classic example. Uh, you know, if you think of anorexia today, it's often in families. Uh, that are sort of wealthier families, well-educated families, young women who feel like they don't have real control, that this is a way they can actually have some control over their lives. Same thing, 17th century China, you know, wealthy families, very well-educated, uh, the girls were even well-educated, but they had no control over their lives, none. You know, they were just told who they were going to marry, whatever, everything was just controlled for them. If you think of the medieval women saints, wealthy families, educated women, no control over their lives. They stop eating and guess what happens? They start to have visions because they're starving. So there are these sort of pockets in history around the world of these women who now we can look back and see, oh, this is sort of cl a classic cluster of anorexia and, and sort of how that um, manifests and how people treat them and, and, you know, if something kind of comes out of it, like the lovesick maidens and, and all the writing that they left behind or those, those saints who um, often also left quite a bit of writing behind. So, I don't know, I think it's just really very interesting and, and 
Again, you know, for me, when you say there were no women artists, were no women historians, were no women chefs, were no women architects, you know, there were women, but supposedly they didn't do anything. Well, here's an example of something that women did that is still, you can still read it today. Uh, these, these lovesick maidens were part of a much larger phenomenon in China of these writing women, more women writers. Uh, in the mid-17th century in the Yangtze Delta, more women writers there than in all the rest of the world at that time. Women writers who were being published. Now, of course, there weren't very many women writers being published in the rest of the world at that time. But in this one small area of China, over a thousand women writers who were writing, being published, going out on the 17th century version of book tours, supporting their families with their writing. You know, we know nothing about them. So I just, I had so much fun with that book. I just loved it. So 2007, 2009, 2011, one can't help but notice that Lisa C. books come out in odd numbered years. Is there something for 2013? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, is it coming? No. 2014. No. It's getting, I got postponed for a year. So this time, I'm instead of every other year, it's gonna, there's going to be three years in between. And the next book is called China Dolls. And it takes place in this country during the nightclub era. 30s and 40s when there were these Chinese American nightclubs for Chinese American performers and so these were people billed as the Chinese Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, the Chinese Frank Sinatra, the Chinese Sophie Tucker, the Chinese Houdini and uh, they would tr not only perform in their very specific Chinese American nightclubs but would also travel around the country club to club as kind of novelty acts and when they did that they didn't say oh I'm going out on the borscht belt or I'm going out on the chitlin circuit they'd say I'm going out on the chop suey circuit so I have spent the last couple of years uh, interviewing the performers who are still living people in their early 90s late 80s and it's just been incredible really incredible fun to meet these people Lisa C thanks for visiting mixed reality cabaret thank you for having me